Okay. So, welcome to the Earning Freedom Podcast. I am Michael Santos with Success After Prison and michaelsantos.com, where I'm always striving to provide guidance and information for people who are in custody, people who are in prison, people who are on the verge of going to prison. What I like to do is show them the strategies that can help them return to society strong. What made all the difference for me were the decisions that I made when I was starting off on a 26-year journey in federal prisons of every security level. But I like to show other inspiring figures. And today I have the privilege of introducing my new friend, Abner. Abner not only served time in prison, he was in high security penitentiaries, he was gang affiliated, but that did not stop Abner from becoming an incredible success. That's why I call him a mastermind because we can learn from my man, Abner Garcia. Abner, welcome to the Earning Freedom Podcast. Tell us a little bit about your background. Thank you for having me, Michael. Well, my background, Puerto Rican. I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I was uh, incarcerated. What for... brought you into the prison system, Abner? What, what kind of background do you have from Brooklyn? Where are you from in Brooklyn? Uh, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Around That's around Red Hook area and what's on Sunset Park. Okay. Brooklyn. And uh, my, the, my upbringing was a typical, you know, kid from Brooklyn, growing up, playing stickball, playing manhunt. And from there, I graduated to, you know, bigger, better things, as they say, you know, smoking cigarettes. Then from the cigarettes, it led to marijuana and to being acquainted with people in the street and gangs, you know. What, ga what type of gangs were you with, Abner, as a young I, boy? I was initiated with the Latin Kings. Okay. So you were a king, and, uh, and were you involved in that from the time you were how old? I was involved from the time for about 16 to from about 35. About years old. And, and how did that, being involved with, a, with the Latin Kings, how did that influence your life from the time you were 16, your education, and, and any challenges you may have had with the criminal justice system? Oh, it, 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 it had a big influence because being a fatherless uh, uh, man, growing up when you're a kid, you don't have that father figure or that guidance. So I, I took it upon to, to be with, with gang members, older gang members, and, and they kind of took that role as father figures for me. You know, you're a, mo you're a father figure for a lot of people who are in prison right now, Abner, because they're listening to you and learning from you because you're an individual. A lot of those individuals came from the same type of background, and they're also looking for guidance. Unfortunately, a lot of them get guidance from the wrong places where they need to be learning from are leaders like you who've gone through the struggle but managed to turn their life around. Tell us, when you were, when you were still involved in the gang activity, how did that influence your adjustment when you started getting sucked into the criminal justice system? Well, when I started getting sucked into the justice system, it, you kind of feel like it's a normal thing to go to prison, to get a parole violation, to be acquainted with people that are committing crimes, you know, criminals, which I was a criminal. So that cycle of having those friends and having those acquaintances kind of it, it, it kind of sucked me in to the point that there was no way of me turning back around. You know, my, my upbringing and my crimes extended from attempted murder, accessory to murder, to, to assaults, kidnappings, stick-ups. Like, you know, I, I, I never robbed a, a, a liquor store or, or, or a business, but I robbed drug dealers at gunpoint, whether it was one, two, three, or four or five drug dealers in the house. You know, it influenced me to the point that I thought it was normal to go to prison. And the friends that I had, that the, one, the acquaintances I called friends, they, they were normal to me. What they did was normal. So you, you, you come to a world to, uh, to think you understand and say, hey, this is what is dealt for me. This is my hand. And this is who I am, which that's a lie. And it, they kind of brainwash you to thinking that they are... In, that you're a leader or you're in control. Rather, you're being puppeteered by someone that has no influence whatsoever in your life or doesn't, is it supposed to have influence in your life? You know, the sad thing about it, Abner, is that a lot of guys in prison, they're still living under that misconception 
that, you know, you got to build your, your prison reputation, be a shot caller, run with the gang, run with the homies, whatever the case is. But the reality is that I experienced during the 26 years that I served is an individual can make decisions early on to begin changing his life and, and positioning himself for a better outcome. That's why I'm so grateful to you because I know you've got tremendous respect in every penitentiary in the United States just because of the amount of time that you served. But what the real value comes is in the message of what you've seen and what you've learned. So when you were going through that prison system, tell us how you were adjusting inside of the penitentiary. Well, when it, the, the way I adjust, I pretty much try to keep to myself. And, and there's a, a, a politics in prison. And the politics are you're, you're guilty by association. So automatically, if you're, you're Latino, or if you're a gang member as a, as a Latin King, whatever comes with a rotten apple, you have to take a bite out of that rotten apple. So if something happens, no matter how much you try to avoid it, you are guilty by association. So, and I used to try to like stay away from the politics of it. So rather me being involved with people that are, that are, that are becoming bad for the health of the gang, I used to try to even stay away from them, but it was kind of hard because the shot callers, so-called, the leaders, they were the first ones to say, don't use drugs. But meanwhile, they're getting in debts in prison for heroin debts, you know, for bundles, bags, grams, and, and they try to take control of that, 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 that uh, politics of taking control of whatever comes through visitation or whatever drugs, or anything that's in the compound. So and, the best thing you do is to try and tie, turn your way around that and, and, and disassociate yourself with that. What, what prisons did you serve your sentence in, Abner? I was uh, indifferent because of my behavioral problems. I'm, uh, I have PTSD and uh, anti antisocial disorder and mood swings, you know, and uh, I refuse to be labeled, you know, but I, I was because of my behavior and my violent temper, I went from prisons like Lewisburg, Atlanta USP, which are max prisons in the federal system. Yeah, I was and at Atlanta USP. What year were you there? I was there on a transfer, I would say from, I was there from 90, locked up from 98 to 2005, but I was there around 99 to 2000. Okay, and, and then you said you're at USP Lewisburg. USP. What other prisons did you serve time at? Ray Brook, Otisville, uh, yeah. they were all, all mediums, never, medium highs, never a, a, a camp, which I wish, but, <laughs> uh -huh. and, and you know, it was always uh, uh, like on transfer. I was in Oklahoma, and I wouldn't understand why I was taken from Brooklyn, MDC, on a flight to Oklahoma just to go to Otisville, which was 45 minutes away. Yeah. You know? And they call it, you know, the diesel therapy right. that they call it, you know. But I was also in, uh, in uh, the state, New York State. I was in, uh, in uh, Wyoming, next to uh, uh, Attica. I was in, uh, I took programs, you know, uh, that I didn't necessarily have to take. But at the end of my time, <coughs> at the end of my last bid, which the bid is a term that they use for, for my last prison term, my last bid in the state, I started taking programs that I knew weren't gonna benefit me because I was a violent offender. So if I took a drug program and I'm not a drug addict, it wasn't gonna do me any good. I wasn't gonna get no time off. So I started disassociating myself from prisons and people and places. So I talked to my counselor and they said, you wanna go to the, that program? You, you don't have drugs, you know, you're here for violence. I said, yeah, but I wanna go to a more laid back prison which there's no politics, you know? Mm -hmm. And I dropped my colors in prison, which they, they say. And I, I stopped involving myself and having a, a, a tat sleeve tattoos all over my body. <clears throat> it was kind of hard to, to avoid it while you're taking a shower with 10 guys. So, you know, it was like, I, I found religion, but I found a way out. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, it, it wasn't the religion. It was the message in it because... How long were you in prison altogether? From 19... From 2000... Well, 1993 
to 2009 was the last time, but I was released in 2012, April 26, 2012. But on and off from 93 to 2012, I never spent the whole year out in the street. So, so I you was- were, you were in and out of prison yeah. different times? Yeah, I was kind of like doing life on the layaway plan, as yeah, they say. <laughs> I, I, how did you, so if you can look back right now, Abner, and say your early adjustment, what would you, if you were given a message to somebody who's serving time, what would you like that, what would you like to have communicated to you back then, brother? I would, I'm a man of God now and a, and a, and a God-fearing Christian, but the politics of, of, of prison, they tend to say, hey, if somebody has a Bible or a Kufi or a Quran, they're hiding behind religion. So if I were to go back, those same people, the first one that said, hey, Jesus Christ loves you, I would have asked them more about what he's talking about rather than say, hey, man, you're just scared because maybe you're a rapist, a child molester, or, or a snitch or whatever, or a label they put on you in prison, and just get away from me. I, I, would, I should have said, hey, come near me and let me hear what you have to say, what more you have to say, because that's the only way. It wasn't no parole violation. It wasn't no programs. I would have to say the surrendering to Jesus Christ, to, the surrendering to say, to picking up a Bible and saying, wow, this Bible kind of has content in it from the brainwashing of the rules in the gang. So it was like, kind of like, they got this from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, I would say to someone that's in prison and incarcerated, to be honest with themselves, to stop lying to the system, to stop blaming the system, to stop blaming the people that called 911 on you or the people that took the stand on you to start blaming yourself and saying, and taking responsibility as a man and saying, hey, I, I gotta stop, enough is enough. Because well, I'm glad they, that people in prison right now have the opportunity to listen to your wisdom, as Abner, but I know you didn't only pick up a Bible, you also picked up a pen and a piece of paper and you put it to work. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you transformed your life once you made the decision to surrender and show us the, the, the progress that you made as a, as a human being who wanted to redeem himself. Okay, the, the last time I, it was, I was in prison, I had my last year left. And <clears throat> I was in a in Wyoming media prison. Wyoming was known for a lot of cuttings and stuff between gangs. And there wasn't a, 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 a war gangs between the land kings and, and the bloods. So when I'm in that, 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 that prison, my last year to go home, they already gave me my papers and said, you have 12 months left, you're going home. They come and they pick me up. They picked up all the Latin Kings and I was accused of something I didn't actually do. So I spent my last year in the box, which is SHU, Special Housing Unit. I spent my last year there and here I am. I can't get a haircut. I can't get my clothes you know, to go home my last year and I'm in the box. So at that time, I didn't understand it. So I, I started acting out, you know, and this guard that nobody liked, you know, he hands me a Bible. He throws me a Bible. So think about it. I'm 23 hours a day locked in besides a little hamster cage, 23 hours, seven days a week locked in a cage, and he hands me a Bible. So I ignored it at first. But I, I, I put all those, those uh, books, the prison books that we're going to call them, uh, uh, sex books, I put them away. And I started reading the Bible, and I actually started feeling guilty, guilty about the way I was acting and, and, and the things I had done. And it was kind of like a full surrender. So I started, gra I grabbed a little half a pencil that they give you in the SHU and a couple pieces of paper, three, four, that they give you every Sunday with two stamps. So I started writing and giving the stamps away for the paper. And people looked at it like, you want four or eight pieces of paper for a stamp? Hey, any day, you know. So I started writing and I started writing a book, a book about, I didn't know it was a book. I was writing about the things, bad things I had done, you know, and as a Christian, it's called a testimony. So I wrote it, you know, and, and, and went home. After the year, 
you know, with my, my khakis on from prison, my state boots, and, and a bag full of letters and dreams. So I went home, you know, and I stopped. I, st- I said, I got to get a job. And I started get I got a job, my first job, and I just started seeing the way people were different when, when How they were. You, Adam? I was 35 years old. I am, Tell us a little bit about what it was like to try and get a job after being in prison for about 20 years. Oh, absolutely impossible. It was like every, every place I went was a closed door. But I knew, so I started to prepare myself and say, hey, the, 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 at the right time, they're going to say, hey, you know, we're going to call you back, which they never do. <clears throat> I just wanted that opportunity to speak at an interview, which I did. You know, and I went on from jobs here and there as far as construction. But when I was in the jobs, I knew it was me that was the problem, not the, 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 the employer. It was me, the employee. I have a criminal background record. So I started being honest, you know, and I started saying, hey, I'm a changed man. I need an opportunity. I'm a man of God. I don't, I don't sell drugs. I don't stick people up. I don't, I don't carry a gun no more. I'm, I'm, I'm a God-fearing man. I'm a humble man, and I, I'm faithful to my wife. I have a, a wife I have to take care of, a family. And they started actually giving me the jobs. And, you know and, something? And- I want to I stop and, and point something out right there, Abner. The reality is you started making some decisions when you were in that segregated housing unit Yes. To transform your life, number one, and the work that you did besides praying and asking God for strength and asking God for guidance. I don't even know if I have one here because now I'm out here in society and all I have are computers. But I, you picked up a pen. Yes. You used that pen to start writing out your story. And by writing out your story, I know because I did it myself, you became more confident with the use of language and being able to express yes. yourself. Yes. And it made it easier for you to persuade an employer why he should give you an opportunity yes. to work and prove worthy. And if you're listening to this episode inside of a prison, it's my hope that you will find inspiration in Abner's story. Because not only did he decide to transform his life, it's easy to talk about it. It's easy to pray about it. What's not easy to do is to put in the work and write yeah. hundreds of pages and telling your story, and articulating your testimony, and introspecting. And that's what we teach in the Earning Freedom Mastermind course. I'm just so grateful to have a real live mastermind, Abner, on the show, telling us that's what made the difference for him. That's what helped him get a job. That's what's going to help you if you're listening to this program. Abner, do you have a copy of your book with you? Yes. Actually, I have a copy in English and Spanish, which... I learned and wrote it in Spanish because I knew I was going to need it. <laughs> so uh-huh. I have a copy here, which my book is titled The Pastor's Son, and in Spanish, El Hijo del Pastor. Uh-huh. And my book basically is, I, I, I collect royalties every month. It's on Amazon. It's on Kindle. It's on Fire. It's, it's, it's all on a couple, Barnes & Noble. I have done book signings, interview. I travel to the United States. But on top of that, God had blessed me with an international gospel singer as a wife. So I'm also a music manager. You know, she she has done two albums. But my book is titled The Pastor's Son. And my father being a pastor, I'm not actually talking about him. I'm talking about God, the pastor's son. And my dad was a pastor. And he divorced my mom at at the age of five, left, you know. But I, 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 I... in the book, there's prison bars, there's me there, you know. And even with the book, my book ended up getting published for free through a member of a church that knew someone. It's always someone that knows someone, and God will put them people in your path. So they edited it for me. They, they published it. They, it's, it's everywhere now. You know, I travel. I have now, are one you earning a living from selling your book, Abner? Yes, I do. I collect monthly royalties. With my wife, I don't collect with the, the managerial. We split that and put that in the account. But <clears throat> I, I, I give up uh, speakings, book signings. You know, I, I speak to kids on, on juvenile detention center, and I'm still on parole. I owe one year 
left exactly to the date till next year on parole. This is, I accomplished all this while being on parole, no violations, no police contact, driver's license, BMW, I have been blessed. You know, there's no excuses. I had I didn't have to sell one bag of dope to have what I have. I've been living in a condominium with all white neighbors. I'm the only Spanish person here. You know, I went from a jail cell, you know, a prison jail cell to a condominium one hour away from New York, next near Westchester, New York. I I there's no excuses. My even with my parole. I, I gave speakings in front of the judicial system in Albany, in front of Governor Cuomo. They took me from a category one parolee to a category four, to a non-supervised. That means they don't come to my house. I don't have to humiliate myself and, and show my privates every month. None of that. Next year, I'll go get my release papers, get my passport, and start traveling the world and giving my testimony and, and to tell people that, Whoever's listening right now, your testimony, everything that you went through that's bad is called a testimony. And everything that you have went through, God will wash away and he will recompense you fullest, fullest to the highest. So what you're doing right now, my advice, take a pen and paper and start writing down and apply it. Because once you go home and the women are back in your life, and your fake friends are back in your life, and your 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 the people that called you friends and, and were not there, you're gonna actually forgive them. You need to forgive yourself for the bad things you have done and start praising the good things you should be doing in your life. Well, we need to all learn from people like you, Abner, people who have been successful in turning their life around, even though you made a series of decisions that puts you into the criminal justice system. The reality is for many of the millions of people who are locked up and trapped in the criminal justice system, they were reared, they grew up in environments like you grew up, environments where people, where there was poverty, environments where there were not a lot of positive role models. And so it was easy for them to get sucked into the types of decisions that brought them into the prison system. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't have enough role models to help them get out. And that's what earning freedom is about. We want to profile and, and give, give thanks to people like you who've really done it because you're an inspiration and you're a role model to those people inside who really need to see that it can happen for them also. So yeah. I'm just so grateful to you for sharing your story with our audience. You are going to show us a picture, I think, of your book. Did you have a photograph? Yeah. In I have several pictures in here. This is a picture of me with long hair, you know, fully in the gang, you know, fully gang pose, right over left, you know, the politics, hair down on my knees. And sometimes I sit there and look at the old pictures from prison, which I use in my PowerPoints when I do speakings. But it takes, it took me there. And at the end of the book, it has a picture of me. The first time I gave my testimony to an audience at a church, preaching you know i i wear a shirt tie you know it's it, it's not about the attire but i just had to pay respects to 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 my mentor god but nowadays and in the back of my book is a picture of me and my wife you know and it's it's it, sometimes i sit back and i look and i i look at myself and say i was really gone i was really you know. you, you're, you're awesome testimony. I, I, but you know, a lot of the people that we're trying to reach in prison, a lot of them are skeptical and they're cynical. And they don't, yeah. want it, they don't believe it, that if they do this, they can be successful. Would they you can. be open with our audience and let us know how if somebody makes the full change, if they put the full work in, how much can they earn if they create their own job like you're doing? Okay. Put it this way, if I was to work on a minimum wage job, my earnings would be anywhere from maybe $2,000 a month, $2,500, you know, child support takes half, you know, you go there, you know, and you end up with hardly nothing. Sometimes you feel a little guilty, you know, but 
I'm my own boss and God is my boss. So if I go to a church and sell 300 books at $15 a piece, you know, those are earnings for the ministry. But if, I, if the books are being sold on Amazon, Kindle, Barnes and Noble, and I'm getting my royalties, that's my money. That's money for the house, you know, or my wife sells CDs. You can make anywhere in thousands, thousands of dollars a month, no matter how much, it's how much time you put into it and how much you want to do with it, you know. But and you're it, earning a full living just full living, your full testimony living. and inspiring people and doing what you love. Full living. Well, I want to tell anybody in prison that if you can listen to Abner's story, you can see where he's living in a high-end condominium, doing what he loves, serving God, serving his community and showing people that regardless of what bad decisions you may have made in the past, you can always turn your life around, find opportunities to develop a skill set and become successful and build dignity and build pride. You don't need to do it by going the bad route, which can guess keep you getting sucked into the prison system. You heard Abner say, you know, he was sucked in, made decisions, got out. He was never out for more than a year. But now, while he's on parole, he's living the dream. He is successful. He is respected. They dropped his security down from a level one to a level four. He's got liberty. He's got self-pride. He's got self-esteem. That's why he's a mastermind. And, and Abner, I know that you can tell other people how they can do the same thing. Yes. They, the first thing is being honest with yourself. You know, we can fool the parole officer, we could pull, fool whoever we're married to, whoever we're living with. We can use them. We can use them for prison. Write a letter. Hey, send me money. Yeah, I'm, I don't have any money on my commissary. You have to start being honest and say, I, I don't need your money. I'm okay. I don't need anything. Now is when I start struggling. Now is when I start being honest with myself and saying, you know what? Enough is enough. I, I'm going to stop lying. I'm going to stop uh, uh, using drugs because I want to stop using drugs. Not because if I get a, a, a dirty urine, I'm going to go to prison for a violation and have to go into Willard program or do something like that, you know? No. You have to start with yourself. You have to start, and they teach you this, in anger management and drug program, peace, people play places and things. People, places, and things. You have to start changing them. You can't expect not to change if you don't change these things. You know, the people that you're around. Start being around people that are positive. People that are gonna help you, not help you get a job, people that own a business. Those are the type of friends that you need in your life. Not people that, that need a ride. You need people that own dealerships that are gonna help you get a vehicle so you can get where you have to be. You know, you have to utilize the same mentality in prison, the same street smarts, but you apply them positively. So once you go home, you have to say, okay, I, I can't sell drugs. I can't do this. I can't do that. No, it's, you could do it. You have free will. You have to tell yourself, that's not me no more. I have to start applying myself positively. You know, it, it, I have seen people you know, we had a seminar not too long ago, a convention, with a, a guy that was cured from hepatitis C. Somebody would say, oh, he, you know, he was chewing heroin and he caught hepatitis C. This guy's a pastor, drives a Bentley, and lives in, a, in the outskirts of Atlanta. And how he got there from a place in a prison in New York and being homeless. It's, 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 it wasn't all the way God. It was him telling himself, I believe in something and I'm going to apply it to something. So I don't, you don't have to be religious. You don't have to be Christian. You don't have to be Muslim. You don't have to be anything. You know, you could still have your God. You could have Allah. You could have Christ. You could have wherever you want, but you need to start believing in something. So if you're not believing in the religion that you're in, you need to start believe, believing in your DIN number or you need to start believing in your name because that's the only way you're going to value yourself and people are going to say, hey, you know what? This guy really did change. You know, 
My parole officer doesn't bother me at all. He knows who I am. He can Google me now. You know, you don't have to go to a Bureau of Prisons. You could Google my name and it'll tell you my outdate, <laughs> where I live in, but he can Google me now. But I didn't have to tell him about who I was. And I said, I want to transfer uh, uh, seven hours away from where you released me. Okay, no problem. He's no problem. First time. He says, you just pack your stuff up and go. I, I couldn't believe it. I said, no, no supervised visit or nothing. He said, no, just go. We'll put the address down. We'll send you the release papers when you're getting off parole. Only, and it's not because, it's because they believe. They know I'm not the same individual. They know the, the people that I'm associated with now, you know, are not the same people. I, my, my phone went from a prepaid phone, an Obama phone, to an iPhone 6. And my phone is full now of Christians, pastors, police officers that I, I, I mentor their kids. You know, so it, it's not, the system's not the enemy. The police are not the enemy. You know, we are our own enemies because we have control of our life. Regardless of now, we have control of the decisions we make. And, and if we keep making the same decisions over and over, it's like they say, you know, you could, you could be crazy, but if you become insane, it's because you're doing the same things over and over and over. You become insane. Abner, what was your Latin king name? King Poet. King Poet. We're going we're gonna to title this King Poet Becomes the Pastor's Son. We're going to le give links to your website, give links to your book. And I, if people want to reach out to you, because I'm going to write some show notes for this, um, Abner, where do I link them to? You can link them to abnergarciafolero.com, or you can link them to uh, Abner Gar uh, uh you could go on Amazon, the pastor's son. Uh, but I'll you could just, a link to your website, to your Amazon, so people can download it. Yeah, one thing I just <laughs> want to say, we are almost out of time here because I, I can only store so much to put it on a CD to get these into prisons. I just want to say you're an incredible role model, and you gave us real wisdom here. What we talk about in Earning Freedom is exactly what Abner expressed, right? If I walked into a prison and tried to fake myself out as being a gang member, people would see me in a second. In a second. No if you come out here in society and you try and pretend to be straight, to be right, people will see in a second if you're not for real. Yeah. But when you're for real, like my friend, the mastermind Abner Garcia, used to be known as the Latin King poet. He is now a leader in society. He has all the benefits that come along with it. And he's given us the wisdom so that you can too. Abner, we're about out of time, but I'm going to ask you to give the last word to our brothers who are still locked up, what they can do to change their life. The last word. The last word. If you're in there, rather you're in solitary, whether you're in the compound, whether you have a girlfriend, rather you don't have a family member, rather you don't have anything, you have yourself. And if you have a release date, if you have a release date, you got more than that guy that his release date is death. He's that guy that has life that's going to stay in there. And even that guy still has life after he passes away. You know, he still has a chance at salvation. But for those that are in there, whether you're doing a year, three years, 10 years, where you have 30 days left, tell yourself honestly, if where you're at right now is what you deserve, all you have to do is look around in prison and say what you're eating, what you're wearing, the time you go to sleep, and what you do all day that's control. Ask yourself if that's for you. If you ask yourself in the mirror and say that's for you and you're fine with it, then there's no need for me to tell you what to do after that. But if you find yourself and you tell yourself, this ain't for me, then start applying that every day to your release from there. That's the wisdom from my friend Abner Garcia, author of The Pastor's Son. 
We will be linking to his book. I encourage you to read his book because you will learn how he transformed his life and how you can do the same. I am Michael Santos with Earning Freedom and Success After Prison. We'll be back tomorrow with another inspiring guest. Thank you. God bless you. God bless.